I'm glad you're here today. Thanks for joining us. My name's Kyle, and while I was giving announcements, our youth group presented me with a t-shirt, and I'm opening this up for the very first time. I have no idea what's going on here, so this is risky, but uh, I don't know if that means they don't like the shirt I'm wearing. Pastor, there we go. Oh, I didn't read the rest. Because Hardcore Devil Stompin' Ninja is an official job title. <laughs> Love it. Thank you for that. I don't know who, I'll just thank the whole youth group. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Next week will be uh, one year since this church, the search team, the elders, deacons, you invited me to come be your pastor. And in this past year, there's been a lot of change. And I just want to take a moment to say uh, first, thank you for those who've given and served and been a part of all the different work projects. And around Easter, we started an initiative called Up to Date. There were some things that we needed to do just to get up to date from the parking lot to the roof over our head, to the carpet underneath our feet. I say carpet, you, you, bad memories come to your mind <laughs> for those who are scraping glue. We've been able to launch a new website, get a new soundboard. We started painting the church this week. We put in some new windows. Last week, we have to do some stucco work to do. But all that to say, everything we desire to do after Easter, our goal was to get it through through the summer. Uh, we've been able to get done. So thank you. We've, we've knocked it all out. We have a little bit of work left to do, but uh, we, because of your generosity, we were able to do what we said we were going to do. So thank you for that. Yeah. Now with that, also this past year, there's been, there's been a lot of change. And a year ago, the church asked me, hey, would you come be our pastor? Here's, here's the one charge that we're asking of you. We're asking that you would help us reach our community, that you would help us think outside, think about the people who are not here. And so I remember in that context, I said, oh, I hear you. Do you really want to do that? Yeah, we really want to do that. Because we can want something, and then when the cost comes, we're not so sure. And so over the course of this past year, there's been a lot of change. And I want you to know I'm aware of that. There's been relationships changed. Some of you have come into the room and you're, somebody else is sitting in your seat now. What happened to my row? I'm aware of that. I'm aware that there's been, when you're smaller, there's some things that you can do and there's more preferences that you can give and there's loss of power maybe in the church. There's been a lot of change. I, I want you to know I'm aware of that and I, I'm so grateful. Thank you for your willingness to go on this journey. It's made us, some of us uncomfortable. Maybe there was a program or a ministry you were a part of in the past that Jesus did a, an incredible work in your life and now that ministry no longer exists or it looks different. It changed. I mean, we added a service there's a lot of change. And I, thank you for your grace. I've not done everything perfectly this first year. I'll be the first to admit. And you're like, yeah, we know. And you have a list and I have a list. We can compare notes. I've made some mistakes. As we come to the first year, I just want to say to you, don't get comfortable. There's more change coming. Okay? And you can use those words to me when I get comfortable. You can say, hey, you, you said not to get comfortable. It is really easy for a church to get comfortable. And, oh, this is great. Some of you, uh, there's, there's many new people here, and you might be new, and I'm so glad you're here, and you're looking around like, I don't know anybody. Well, most of the room feels the same way you do. There's, there's a lot of, if any of you ever started a startup company, the first part of the startup is chaos. We're in the chaos right now, and that's okay. It's okay to live. We can't live in the chaos forever. But right now, there's, there's a little bit of chaos. Like, who picked the paint colors, right? That's, that's the topic of today. <laughs> who picked the carpet colors, right? Thank you for your grace. Would love your opinion on some of that. You can step up. Would love to hear your feedback on some of that. Not all of it, but on some of it. 
uh, but, but really grateful. God's not done with Boulder Mountain. There's, there's some empty chairs in the room that he knows who's going to be filling those chairs in the days ahead. We had an opportunity yesterday to be at Zaharis Elementary. They were celebrating Boulder Mountain Neighborhood, which is just north of us here. They're 25 years as an, as an HOA, as a neighborhood. And so I thought, hey, we probably should be at that. We're Boulder Mountain Church. Let's go to the Boulder Mountain Neighborhood. Had a great, great time. The mayor of Mesa was there. We were able to interact. And people in the neighborhood just north of us were like, where are you guys at? Didn't know you were there. We're, we're like a half a mile away, a mile away. We need to be engaging our community, letting people know we're here. And the message we have for them is, is a good message, one of good news of great joy. No matter what they're going through, we, we have the solution. Jesus is, is the answer. And so there's more opportunities coming up. Um, don't let me get comfortable, and I won't let you get comfortable. Deal? Deal. So thanks for going on the journey uh, with us as a church. In a couple of weeks, their leadership board and elders were getting away to spend a couple days praying and discerning, asking God for wisdom on what, what do we do next. Okay, we, we brought the church up to date. Now what about tomorrow? Where are we going as a church? From things like facilities to we own this land next door. What are we going to do? How are we going to reach people who don't know Jesus? So be praying and grow those who do know Jesus, right? Our mission is we're going to make disciples. And we're going to talk about that today. How do we make this? What's a disciple? An all-in follower of Jesus. An all-in follower of Jesus. As we help people find Jesus who've never met Jesus and follow Jesus. People who who know Jesus, but we're going to take steps to continue to follow him. We're in a series called Sense. We're looking at the book of Acts. So if you're a guest with us, thanks for joining us in the middle of the series. There's some Bibles by the door if you need to follow along. You can also pull out your device and follow along online. A couple of weeks ago, just to bring you up to speed, we saw Peter and John stand bef before the very same group of people who tried Jesus and put Jesus to death, the Sanhedrin, Peter and John, and then Peter gives message. Today, we're looking at another sermon. It's a sermon worth dying for. It's a sermon by Stephen. And just to, before we get to Acts chapter 7, who is Stephen? We're introduced with Stephen. He's a follower of Jesus. I came to know Jesus in, the, in this past year. So he's been following Jesus for about a year. From the, death of, from the time of the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, to, to Acts 7, we're about a year, okay? So in that year, he's met Jesus. He was baptized, gave his, had made a public profession of faith. And then he was invited to leadership. Some of you in the room, you're part of leadership at Boulder Mountain. You, you're serving ministries, you're leading different ways. Thank you. But there was a moment where the disciples realized they couldn't do everything. And they... They were preaching God's word. They were taking care of everything. Then there was this group of widows that needed food. They needed to be served. They needed to be cared for. They needed to be prayed over. They needed to be shepherded. And so in Acts chapter 6, you don't need to turn there, but I'll read it, or you can turn there and follow along. <clears throat> the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this day. But we'll devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. They chose Stephen, full of wisdom and of the spirit. Interesting, it doesn't say that about the other six. But of Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And of Philip goes through and names the others. So that's our first introduction to Stephen. And the word of God continuously continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So Stephen is preaching. We're gonna look at the passage I just read a little bit more next week when we talk about the leadership of the church. But Stephen is preaching. He gets called into question just like Peter and John did. He gets pulled into a trial. Right, common denominator in Acts, there's a lot of trials going on. Stephen's brought to trial. In the beginning of Acts 7, the high priest said to Stephen, are these things so? 
And Stephen said, his response is the longest sermon in the Bible outside of Jesus' sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest sermon in the book of Acts, longest sermon in the New Testament. It's a sermon worth dying for. He's bold, with great faith, great courage, Stephen preaches. But ministry is so much more than just the pulpit. Ministry is so much more than simply preaching. I added up the time I spend actually preaching a sermon compared to all the other hours of the week, and it's about 1% to 2% of my week is actually doing what I'm doing. There's a lot of other things going on. And before Stephen, Stephen preached a sermon, he sat with widows. He earned the right to preach by sitting with widows, by serving tables. As we go through this passage where we're going with this passage, at the end of chapter 7, Stephen becomes the very first martyr, the first person to give his life for the sake of the gospel. Now, it would have been very unlikely for Stephen to have not been married. So we believe he was married. Very likely he was married. As I'm, I'm thinking about this, Stephen gives his life. He, he dies, making his wife a widow. She then joins the very same group of people who Stephen knew very well. Is that that sweet? Stephen served the widows. He busts their tables. Anybody ever bust tables before? It's like the nastiest job in a restaurant. You work your way up to busting tables, because I, I did this, busting tables to dishwasher, maybe eventually get out of the kitchen. But he busts tables. He served the widows. There was a debate going on about which widow should be served, and he stepped in and solve problems and, and shepherd people. And as he gives his life, his wife then becomes, becomes a widow. What does it mean to be a martyr? The very first martyr we see here in Acts chapter seven. It means to bear witness, to testify, to point to something. As Stephen preached the sermon he spoke truth. Now, if I were to see a show of hands in the room today, there are two types of people in the room. There are grace givers. You lean on the side of grace. And there are truth tellers. One of, we all lean one way or the other. And parents in the room, your kids know which one is who. Right? They're going to go to the grace giver, whoever that is. We're told in Scripture to be full of grace and truth. Stephen speaks truth, but he begins out of love. He's speaking. Who does he speak to? Who does he address? Verse, chapter 7, verse, I think it's verse 2. Brothers and fathers. You're my brother. Brothers and fathers. We have a lot in common. He's appealing to them. And then he goes and he talks about the entire Old Testament history. It's a great sermon. Talking to the fact that God in the Old Testament desired to have a temple and he talks about the temple in the different locations and then at the end he talks about but God does not dwell in buildings made of man. Verse 42 we'll pick up. But God turned away and gave them over to worship to the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your God, Repton, and the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dis dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the most high does not dwell in houses made by hands as the prophet says. Now he's referring to the Old Testament multiple times. I might've said it last week, there are only 12 chapters in the whole New Testament that do not refer to the Old Testament. And I'd say, I'd make a case, even in those 12 chapters, there's indirect evidence of the Old Testament. Heaven is my throne, God says, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? What Stephen is saying is this is 
Today, God does not dwell in buildings. In the past, you've cared more about your tradition. There's a song that we sing, a worship song that we sing. Maybe you remember the lyrics. It talks about shake up my tradition. And maybe some of us are uncomfortable when we get to that line, shake up my traditions. But the song's actually talking about, God, anything that I've added to the gospel, I pray that you would remove. Anything that, that somehow I thought that you love me because, that you would remove that. And Stephen's saying, oh, it's, it's your heart. God cares more about your heart. In verse 51, you stiff-necked people, he's speaking truth here. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now he's speaking, this is a trial. He's been brought up before them. It's at the temple. So he's, he's at their place of worship. He's a follower of Jesus. Now you ask yourselves the question, how can he be put on trial? And ultimately this is going to lead to his death, the first martyr in the Christian church. It's going to, how can they stone him? How can they kill him? But they couldn't kill Jesus, Right? They, they brought Jesus before the Roman government. Well, Jesus was well known. Three years of ministry. The Roman government was well aware of Jesus. And so the Jewish leaders brought Jesus to the Roman government to be able to say, hey, I'm going to wash my hands. You know, right? We have a self-defense here. This is the Roman government making this decision. Stephen, that wasn't the case. No one knew Stephen. Stephen was no name. Stephen hadn't been around, along, around very long. And so... He's infuriating them. Now, sometimes when we speak truth, now the goal when we speak truth is not just to speak truth. Some of, some of us in the room, we know how to speak truth. And we don't care how it's received. We don't care how the person feels. Well, I'm told to just speak truth, so I'm supposed to speak, speak truth, right? Jesus was full of what? Grace and truth. So to the truth people in the room, consider the relationship. Be loving, be kind, speak truth. The goal is not to win. If you're trying to win, nobody wins. So speak truth, have their best interests in mind. It's never not loving to, to it's never not loving to, to not speak truth, right? It's always loving to speak truth, but there's a right way you can speak truth. Does this make sense? Full of grace and full of truth. Some of us, we speak truth, but we don't do it in a very loving, loving way. As we interact and engage with our culture, what's required to win our culture over in 2023 is not megaphones and billboards and protests. It might have been a day that worked, right? But in our culture today, that's, that's not going to work. Are they, still, are they speaking truth? Yes, but not in a very loving way. What, is it, what does it mean to speak truth and grace? And when you do that, it's not up to you how they're going to respond. All right? The response, Stephen, was they were full of anger, full of anger, gnashing their teeth. There was so much anger. And we'll, we'll look at that. Verse 54, now when they heard these things, they were enraged. and They ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, throughout the New Testament, the position that we see Jesus in most of the time is Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. He's seated. His work is accomplished. It is finished. He's seated at the right hand of God. The glimpse that Stephen gets is what? Jesus standing do you picture this? Jesus, ready to receive the martyr, he gets off his throne and he welcomes him eye to eye. Maybe he wraps his arms around him. Welcome. He welcomes. I wonder if he welcomes every martyr that way. There are more martyrs in the last century than all the centuries combined. The numbers of those perishing for the faith is being added to daily the last century was a century of persecution in which more Christians died for their faith than all previous centuries combined. 
Let me just share with you a few of them. As we become aware, we're to pray for the persecuted church. In 1915, Turkish authorities killed over 600,000 Armenians, most of them followers of Jesus. Souls of the martyrs were there. Those souls of martyrs are around the throne. The souls of the martyrs were there. Lenin said there can be nothing more abominable than religion. He ordered the persecution of the Russian Orthodox Church. Stalin extended that persecution to all believers. 1956, the story I wrote about in an article this past week in the email that goes out in the email newsletter, I talked about Through Gates of Splendor. You might be familiar with that book. It was turned into a movie written by Elizabeth Elliot, the widow of Jim Elliot. I have the journal entries of Jim Elliot. It's a book on my shelf. I read them. It had a big inspiration in me going into the ministry. Jim Elliot and his friends, four classmates at Wheaton College, decided to give their lives to, to be missionaries. And they were called to Ecuador. They were called to Ecuador to reach the Aka Indians. And they were killed for preaching the gospel. They were speared to death. But that's not the end of the story. Their widows stayed and led that entire village to Jesus. What of the 10,000 Cambodian Christians slain in 1975? The souls of those martyrs are there. And we go on and on. The Christians slain in China today, in Iran, in Iraq. The church is gathering every nation of the world today, some in secret, some underground, some knowing full well that at any moment their life could be taken from them. Such martyrdom continues to this present day. And the decision to give your life to Jesus is not made in that moment. Stephen did not make a decision while he was preaching, "Uh uh-oh, right? Sometimes a pastor can tell this isn't going well. I, I... That was kind of a joke. You're you're all looking at me. (laughs) Just about every week I feel that way at some point. But Stephen's feeling as he's looking out, this isn't going well. When when those you're preaching to are gnashing their teeth, it's probably not going to end well with a big altar call. And so when he realizes that, I don't think in that moment he's like, I wonder if I should give my life. That decision was made long before. The decision to give your life to Jesus is made in moments like now where you make that decision in your heart of hearts and you, you say, if that day ever comes, I don't, I don't think any of us in the room are gonna be stoned for our faith, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know. In the mid-90s, my wife and I, shortly after marriage, we were young, we didn't know anything, we were called to the mission field, felt like this was where God was calling us. We went to a third world country that was in the middle of a civil war. And three or four months in, I'll go into greater detail if we ever share a cup of coffee or a breakfast or lunch, break bread together, but let me give you the highlights or the lowlights of it. In the middle of our time there, we were accused of being American spies and the police were called on us. Now in this country, we knew enough that an American in prison goes missing. And so we knew we couldn't go to prison. And so we grabbed our passports and we fled out the back door and we ran through the jungle. And I remember praying this, my wife and I were both crying, we were holding hands. It's a moment, maybe you've had moments in your life you'll never ever forget. We were quoting Psalm 23 as we're running through the jungle. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. That didn't mean we weren't scared. Had no idea what was going on. God, you led us here. What is going on? Why are we being chased by police? Being chased by police eventually led to the military hunting us down. But by God's grace, supernaturally led us to the home of a board member of that mission organization that we were with. We did not know that at the time. We were supernaturally led there and we flew out of the country the next day. But I remember in that experience, making the decision, I don't know if that day will ever come, but I'm making that decision now so I don't have to make it when that moment comes. I'm gonna challenge you, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, that you would be an all-in follower of Jesus? Now, some of us are farther along than others in that journey, but we would all get closer to being all-in follower of Jesus. I'm going to count the cost. But for most of us in the room, God's not going to ask us to die for him. What he's asking all of us to do, though, is to live for him. 
What does it look like to live for Jesus? If you're taking notes, when you are, if you're taking notes, first point, to live for Jesus, one must first be willing to die to self. He's calling all of us to live for him. We'll talk about dying a little bit later, but to live for Jesus, what does that look like? What are you and I doing today and tomorrow morning and Tuesday to get uncomfortable? What, what is it costing us to follow Jesus? It is so easy in the American culture and American church even to be comfortable. And, and that comfortable begins to infect the church and we become more concerned with our comfort and our preferences than the gospel. And I'm just challenging all of us, what are we doing to, to sacrifice? What does cost look like for you and I on a day-to-day -day basis? Because our brothers and sisters around the world, they know a thing about, they're not concerned about the paint and the carpet. They're, they, they're, they can teach us a few things about sacrifice and persecution. To live for Jesus, one must first be willing to die to self. Now, die to self. If you're a follower of Jesus, and if you're not, I'm so glad you're here. We can, you can keep going on the journey with us, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, there's a verse. It's one of my favorite verses, Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 says, For I am crucified with Christ. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, We've already been crucified. Your life as you sit here today, if you're a follower of Jesus, is not your own. It is not your own. And forgive me and forgive us as a church when we make it about us. And I find a, it's really hard for me to think I'm gonna be willing to give my life physically when I have a hard time waiting in a drive through line for five minutes. Right? How are you living for Jesus? What decisions have you made recently that cost you so that hurt? I don't know, God, I'm gonna trust you with the results, but I'm gonna step out in faith on this because it's your life. We could say, don't waste your life, but don't waste the life that Christ is living inside of you. Don't waste Christ's life as he lives inside of you. And then the next note, to die for Jesus, one must first be willing to live for Jesus. The decision for Stephen to give his life was made long before the day that he was stoned. It might have been made at his baptism. Baptism's coming up next weekend. Let me give you, might be a next step for someone in this room. Baptism is, doesn't mean we have it all figured out. It doesn't mean we've arrived. It doesn't mean we have all the answers. It means it's the first step. We've given our life to Jesus. Now I'm gonna let everybody know, my friends, my family, my coworkers, I'm going to invite as many people as possible to come let them know who, where my identity is found. It's found in Jesus. And what baptism does, it's a declaration of a work that's already been done on the inside. Now I'm going to let everybody know. It's kind of, we think about baptism, it's like, what's going on? Here? There's nothing special about the water. God doesn't love you more after than before. It's a public explanation. It's just like me wearing my wedding ring. The ring does not save me. The, the ring does not make me married. I'm still married, but it's, a, but it's a symbol. If you've not taken that step of public baptism, let me challenge you to have the courage and the boldness to stand up on the stage and make that declaration next weekend. We will celebrate with you. It's a significant moment. It's a moment you will never forget. And I wonder if Stephen, at his baptism, he said, I'm giving my life to you, Jesus, whatever that looks like, whatever that costs, my fo the follower, Jesus who I followed gave his life. Why would we expect nothing less? And so he there at the end of his life becomes the first martyr. Now, verse 54. Oh, nope, we're going to jump down. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand. But when they cried out with a loud voice, they, they stopped their ears. They covered their ears. They, they didn't want to hear any more of it. They rushed together at him. They carried him out of the city, took him off the temple, carried him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul, can you hold our coats while we kill Stephen? And I believe uh, St. Augustine actually says that without this prayer of Stephen, we would have no Paul. Paul was standing there, witness, he was watching all of this. Now, Jesus meets with Saul later on in the book of Acts.
But I think this moment had a profound impact on this man named Saul. What does Stephen do as they're stoning him? And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. How do we know that he loved the people he was preaching to? There's evidence. He begins, brothers and fathers, and he ends with, God, don't hold this sin against them. They don't know what they're doing. He followed Jesus. Can you remember someone else who said the same thing at their point of death? Jesus, on the cross, said the very same thing. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. And, and I believe the prayer that he said had a profound impact on Saul, who was, whose job was to persecute the church. What would it look like for you and I to have courage and boldness? Tertullian, the church historian Tertullian says, kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow. For the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs. And oh, would we be so bold? Would we ever pray for persecution? None of us want it. And I just, just a moment on what persecution is and isn't. Persecution is not just a bad thing that happens to you. Sometimes it's easy to think, oh, I'm, I had a flat tire on the way to work today. God, I'm being persecuted. No, you drove over a nail. <laughs> persecution, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus said something similar. They persecuted me, they will persecute you. So you begin with your desire to live a godly life. If your desire is to honor God with every moment of your day, if your desire is to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. But the reverse is not true. Just because you're being persecuted does not mean you're trying to live a godly life. And this is how this goes sometimes, even in the church. I'm going to speak truth and they don't like me. No, you, how you presented that truth wasn't very kind. Right? And so speak truth in grace. And you let the results be up to God. But if you're going to live a godly life and you can make that decision today, you will be persecuted. What Stephen said throughout this passage and what he ultimately did, he gave his life, is a result of who he was. It wasn't something that he just randomly at that moment said, I, I wonder if I'm going to do this, right? The biggest decisions in life are, are often made before we're required to have an answer. Settle that account today. If you're taking notes, When you're persecuted for doing good, you're in good company. If you're persecuted for doing good, you're in good company. Persecution feels personal, but it's actually not about you. We very easily can make it about us, but persecution, this was not about Stephen. What do we do as a church when it comes to the persecuted church? Just a few things. There's an organization I follow, uh, Voice of the Martyrs. You can write that down. You can go online. You can read about Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, they're a very informative organization telling, telling us about what's happening all around the world when it comes to our brothers and sisters in the church. Voice of the Martyrs, an organization I trust them. And we're to pray. We're to pray for the persecuted church. Live by faith. If you're taking notes, live by faith. What does that mean for you? Do not make your decisions based on, is this comfortable for me? That's a cop out. Following Jesus requires us to be uncomfortable. It's going to cost us something. It's going to be hard. It's going to sacrifice. Again, I ask the question, what's the last thing, decision that you made that hurt? Being a member of the church is not just about your comfort. Finally, last point there, remember the reward. Remember the reward. All the songs we sang about today, graves in the gardens, I see a victory. There's a reward. 
That's so much better than the reward that this world has to offer any one of us. And so, yeah, we can talk a lot about dying for Christ. And if that day might come in this nation, I believe we're closer today than we were yesterday. I believe there's a day coming where followers of Jesus in the United States will be giving their life for Jesus. When will that be? I don't know. It might be our children. It might be our grandchildren. So let's prepare them. Church, I want Boulder Mountain to be prepared for that day. Don't be surprised by it. You be, you, and today, you can begin to be prepared by making decisions of boldness, decisions of courage. Remember the reward. I believe the reward we'll get from Jesus is better than anything we could ever imagine. I believe the very second he hands us that reward, we'll give it right back to him. We'll lay it right back down at his feet. I mentioned baptism that's taking place next next weekend. If you've not made that decision as a believer, some of us maybe grew up in traditions where we were sprinkled or baptized as a child that had everything to do with your parents' decision. I don't think you had a say in that when you were an infant. This now is an opportunity for you as a follower of Jesus to make that decision public. I would love to have that conversation with you. You can grab me after service or message me this week. What does it look like for you to live for Christ? Galatians 2.20, I'm going to challenge you to memorize that verse. Write it on a postcard, put it in your phone, put it somewhere on your mirror. Would you, would you memorize that verse? For I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer your life. It's no longer my life. It's Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and loved you and gave himself for you. It's the gospel. Would you memorize that verse? That's your homework assignment this week. Galatians 2.20. And every day, challenge, I'm going to challenge you and you challenge me. Pray this prayer. God, make me uncomfortable today. May I do something hard for you today. Something that's difficult. It may not be a stone being dropped on your head. I, I don't know. If, I don't think that's our reality today. But what does it mean to live for Jesus? Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, you're doing, you're speaking to all of us in different ways today. And forgive us for those of us, myself included, when I have ran away from discomfort. I've ran away from the uncomfortable. And would you make the muscle of courage just a little bit stronger in all of us? That our decision process wouldn't be filtered through, is this easy or not? But the decision would be, is this what you are asking of me? Then that answer has already been made. Have your way in our lives. Make us strong. May we pray for our brothers and sisters in unfathomable circumstances around the world today. Would we remember the reward and may we live by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence 
in your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.